and, and the verse I'm using here is Matthew 3.11. It says, John the Baptist speaking, those who repent, I baptize with water, but there's coming a man after me who's more powerful than I. In fact, I'm not even worthy enough to pick up his sandals. He will submerge you into union with the spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. Pentecost happens, and there we see the flames above everybody's head. And I'm going to try to tie this all together with you, but I'm going to try to keep it real and keep it practical. Again, like one of the reasons I, I so honor my wife is for so many years, I was working 70 hours a week on Wall Street. I still i am in the workforce, but I'm not working at that same pace because God has blessed me in a different company now, and, and it's been amazing. But for all those years, our team was carrying the bulk of the load. And um, anyway, anyway, like I said, I, I, there's, there's no church without Trisha, I promise you that. And all the, all the people that have been here since the early days have helped us so much. But this fire is one of those things that we can relate to because, you know, Jeremiah said, I got this fire shut up on my bones. And we also know that there have been times that we've been intensely hot. And then there have been times that we've cooled off a little bit. And we've, you know, something happened in our lives that just kind of took the starch out a little bit. And I'm going to try to try to keep us focused on that today, that this fire is really important to God. And when, when John the Baptist said that you and I would be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, there was a part of that that meant that we have to keep a fire burning in our lives, that we can't allow ourselves to cool off because that's that makes you just... just target of the enemy and, and your immune system drops because for whatever reason there's a crack in your hedge, right? There's a crack and he can come in and attack us. So I'm trying to use practical examples, okay? And when you look and, and, and you look up for keywords like success, this might be one of the one of the graphics that you would see. And it's that idea that, you know, if we just work hard, we're in that little fishbowl, but because of our energy, we're leaping up and we're getting into that next one. And, and then we're leaping up again. And, and I put it that, you know, that's how the kingdom of this world, as opposed to the kingdom of our God, that's how it's talked about in Revelation. There's a kingdom of this world. There's a kingdom of our God, which is available to us now here. Yes, when we die and we go to heaven, yes, but there's a kingdom available here. And we can enter that kingdom but we can also exit that kingdom. When we sin, when we're in the kingdom, there's a protection, there's covering. When we do it our own way and we become rebellious, it says it right in Deuteronomy 28, blessings and curses. Key is obedience, right? And often, because of this competitive world that I lived in, that, you know, not only on Wall Street, but my family was in the garbage business and extremely, extremely hardworking people, you, you really, it would be hard to describe. So from the time I was young, I understood Never saw dad home sick, never saw him on the couch with a thermometer sticking out of his mouth with a blanket on and that little hot water bottle that they used to do. Like, that wasn't my dad and, or any of the people in my family. You worked. That was just it. You just worked. You had to do what you had to do. So this, this fit my background easily, but without the Lord, the Bible says it's vain. You're laboring in vain because unless the Lord builds the house, you're laboring in vain, and that's a really frustrating thing to do. And I realized that as I was jumping fish tanks that looked like promotions, there was something they conveniently forgot to tell me, that fish that are flying through the air can also be very vulnerable to attack. <laughs> that's the world right there. That's not Jesus. That's the world. And you think you're just going upstream, but boom, boy, they're just ready to pick you off Everything looks great on this picture, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, I'm just going to succeed. And then, oops, nope. Uh, something funny happened on the way to the lake. I met a grizzly, a hungry grizzly bear. So I'm going to talk about the fire as the unfair advantage of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Can you say that with me? I have an unfair advantage. Because the Holy Spirit is in me with his fire. Look at somebody else. Say, you have an unfair advantage because the Holy Spirit is in you with fire. Woohoo! So here's, here's how the Lord showed me that it's different between my day job and the kingdom of God. I mean, everybody has probably heard that expression from a movie about Wall Street, greed is good, right? Remember that one? Like, when I sat down for an interview once, the guy said, we're only looking to hire people who love money. 
And I said, well, that's right in the Bible, right? Like, you can't love money and love God, so sorry. It ain't going to work for me. And uh, whatever, you know, here I am, survived that career. And uh, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Often you have to go in the bathroom and make that little stall your prayer closet and just ask the Lord to show up. I need you to show up. And he does. It's amazing. So this is an unfair advantage. And let's just assume for this graph that this is wherever we are right now. Everybody here, you're at a different place on the Lord. We're not trying to compare ourselves to anyone else. But we're supposed to compare ourselves to Jesus. It says that, that we can be transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. I quote it all the time. And, and it's a great goal to think about because, actually, you never fully arrive. But it's what we're targeting. It's what we're aiming for, to be transformed into the image of Christ. And that word transformed is really important. Uh-oh, somebody left my phone on. Don't be texting me while I'm preaching. <laughs> so whatever now means is different for all of us, but it's here. We're here right now. That's, that's the connection that we have. And in a healthy church culture, we should all be looking at each other and saying, you know, I need you to be operating at full potential of what God has for you because if you're not, it hurts me. Because we're a team. We all need each other. Forsake not the assembling together, right? Not just the gathering together, but the assembling together, living life together, understanding when somebody needs help, that we make meals for somebody that, that just lost somebody, right, in, in, in the family, or however it works, we anticipate through Holy Spirit telling us, and, and in order to go higher in the Lord, you have to go lower first, and, and things like, think about the air, the balloons that go up, right, hot air balloons, that they, they get rid of baggage in order to go higher. And that would be a good picture of inner healing, is that we're carrying around baggage with us, and, and the Lord will expose it, and then it's up to us to have to make a decision whether we want to deal with it. And people will say that they want to deal with it, but then they realize it's harder than they thought, and, and there's a flight mechanism that will try to kick in. But when you're surrounded by a bunch of people, we used to say the inmates are running the asylum, right? There's nobody here in leadership who won't admit that they had a bunch of messy things in their lives, and because we got healed, we know God can heal you. Everybody that was up here could say that, and, and every, mostly everybody out there that's been through ministry here understands there's nothing wrong, there's, there's nothing bad in admitting that you're not perfect. I mean, if Paul could say, I have not yet arrived, who are you, <laughs> right, to compare to him? Like, he's a, 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 an amazing man of God, so there's nothing wrong with admitting you're dealing with something, okay? That, whatever, that's another day. But here I am now, and what happens? Somebody, the Lord puts a scripture on my heart, and it's to find my life, I have to lose it. And that sounds really confusing, right? That's not fitting the spreadsheet world. And I'm guessing most of you have pondered that and thought through it. But I would just translate it to say, he has a better life for me than the one I'm living right now. And there's probably something I need to change to be more like him. And I need the courage to say, turn up the heat. Refiner's fire. Remember, they called it dross in the Old Testament, the silversmith. They would turn up the heat to get the impurities out. And nobody likes the heat. But you don't like the dross either. So better to take a little heat and get rid of the poison. Because you don't want to go back to the dross after you got purified, I promise you that. And, and then you're like, oh, man, I'm struggling. What does that mean? I have to lose something about me that needs to change. And, and a universal thing, I would say, is forgiveness could be one topic. I could have picked many, but that could be one of them right now. And there was a terrible, horrific tragedy that just happened yesterday in Buffalo, New York, okay? Okay. So right there, we could talk about forgiveness on that, how hard that's going to be. And there have been times when people have stepped up after a tragedy like that and shown the world what it looks like for a Christian to forgive somebody when there's no reason to do it. That doesn't come natural to us. We have to fight through that and say, Lord, I'm willing to do it your way, even though everything in me doesn't want to do it, but I know you're right. And, you know, it, there's a guy named Ben Shapiro who says, facts don't care about your feelings. And if you're holding unforgiveness, the fact is you're not going to flourish in the Lord in that area. Whatever you're holding in there, it's acting like poison in your system. So, it's like, I got to forgive him? What? We don't like that. Our flesh doesn't like it. Go fast for a while, and, and you'll think of other ways to kill the person that you haven't forgiven. <laughs> so, eventually, it, 
it climbs out of your mouth and you say, I forgive them. God's like, I'll take it. That's better than nothing. But eventually you go through this process and you realize that you have to die to that part of your flesh that was enjoying thinking of choking the person. That's out of the Bible. It says Esau comforted himself thinking about choking his brother Jacob. All right? That's a problem. Let that bitterness go. And that's not an upward move. That's a downward move. That's humbling myself before the Lord that he would lift me up. Because I don't just land on a rock when I land on this. Because it's from the Lord, I land on a trampoline. That's a picture he gave me a long time ago. And, and I never forgot it. Because once you hit that trampoline, you go higher. Because you got rid of some baggage. And now you're lifting up higher with no effort because that thing that was holding you back is gone. And in the book of Hebrews, that says, lay aside the weights that so easily beset you, those sins that are besetting you. And he compares it to running a race. So imagine if you're running a race and you had a 10-pound pack on your back and you got it off. You're going to run faster now. Guess who wins when that happens? Not just you. All of us. Your family. Everybody. The closer you get to being like Jesus, the better we all are, the better the whole world is. And let me say, politics isn't going to save America. A revival is what's going to save America, okay? Politics don't have the answer. Us being involved could help, right? Whatever. I'll keep going. So now whatever it was, you got to the next level. And people think, okay, I'm done now. I've arrived. <laughs> well, you have a lifetime membership in this club. And uh, the only renewal is your flesh, the cost of your flesh having to die about something else. Because once you got past the forgiveness thing, maybe there's something else called judging. I don't know. I've heard it happens once in a while that people judge each other. What do you think? There's discernment that's important that you need to do, but I'm talking about judging someone in a negative way and writing them off and saying, those people, fill in the blank. Bad idea. Bad idea. They'll never change. Bad idea. God doesn't say that, so you can't say if God doesn't say it. Are you praying for them? Are you praying for them to change, or are you praying for something bad to happen to them? <laughs> That's not good prayer, is it? So now I get to the next level, and I'm feeling a little lighter because I'm not carrying that unforgiveness around. But then I hear him say, a new commandment I give you. I'm so upset that he said commandment because that would be like the Ten Commandments. And Jesus is saying, there's a new commandment. Really? What is it? That you have to love other people the way I loved you. Not easy, is it? You could say without the Holy Spirit, there's no way you could do it, right? But with the Holy Spirit, you have to say, sorry, I judged you. And if you want a movie scene for this, I never forgot it. In the movie Hacksaw Ridge, you know, the guy decides he's not going to carry a gun. They want to court-martial him, and they're trying everything they can do to get rid of him. And then on the day of the battle, he's the one pulling all the people off the battlefield. And one of the sergeants comes up to him that gave him a really hard time. He said, I was all wrong about you. I thought you were the biggest coward because you wouldn't carry a gun. I found out you're the bravest man in the whole unit. He didn't have to preach the word. He just had to live his convictions. And that guy had enough courage to say, I was wrong. And, you know, in the AA program, that's a big deal. Making amends is a really big part of it. And it takes a while. But you have to write down all the people that have been hurt, and then you have to go to them. And, and you know what happens? A lot of those people that you go back to, they don't want to hear it because they don't believe you've really changed. And what do they say in the world? Once burned, shame on you. Twice burned, shame on me. Because I'm not going to be duped here. We're in New Jersey. Everybody's running a scam in New Jersey. right? <laughs> You're probably dumb enough to buy a watch on Times Square, they would say. I wouldn't say that about you, but this is the mindset, right? I was born at night, but not last night. This is such typical New Jersey, right? What don't you understand? Is it the N or the O? No. Like, well, you know, that's not exactly Jesus, Bible, Holy Ghost, you know, believe the best about people. But you can't help it because you've had a lot of scams run on you. And you get all this scar tissue in there. And it's like, but I'm right to judge. That person messes up all the time. Well, what are you doing to try to change it before you judge them? Just anybody can call out a problem. How about trying to help them with a solution? The gospel's good news, not good advice. Like if you listen to what Jesus said to do, your life can change. And I would say, really, like I said, part of the power 
of, of the church in the early days was that people's lives were changed by the power of God. There was a demonstration of the power through deliverance, through healing, through people breaking off addictions, whatever it was. It wasn't just somebody making a decision in their mind. There was an actual change in their life. So, okay, oh, I have to stop judging people. <laughs> Because you don't realize how much you're doing it. That we do a class called Bitter Root Judgments, and the people call during the week and they email like, oh my God, everywhere I look, I realize I'm judging everything and everybody. Make it stop. <laughs> we can't make it stop. The Holy Ghost makes it stop. And you say, well, you know, maybe that person's just really having a really bad day. And I'm just going to let them go as they're cutting me off on my way to Route 3 and uh, Lincoln Tunnel. I'm worshiping in my car, so you guys... You just go ahead. I'm early. You're late. You go ahead and be in a rush. You can't steal my joy. I bless you. And your Mercedes. <laughs> oh, man, it's hard. You got to die to something in there to stop judging people. But you got to go down before you come up. And that's a good thing because even when you go down, you hit another trampoline that was higher than where you were before. So your new bottom is higher than your old high. You got it? Because you're higher up than you were. And just one more thing he's showing you, that it's actually for your good to change. It's just hard to change. So we go to the Lord and we say, I offer up my heart to you. All I want is to live within your love, right? Like all the things we were singing about today. Where you go, I go. What you say, I say. I don't want it any other way. Jesus only did what he saw you do. That's a prayer, beautiful prayer. So then you go even higher because you're lighter. And a lot of times the things that are deeper that weren't just above the surface, they're even harder because you didn't see them. They're blind spots. And we heard somebody say last night that his wife was a blind spot, a spotter for his blind spots. <laughs> That's a good word, isn't it? All right, so I land at my new thing, and, and what I like to say is, in, in the corporate world, I'll say, stop being a human doing and being a human being. You know, you're not what you do. You are, you are who you be. I know that's bad English, but they're trying to say, human being means that you're allowed to be, not just do, do, do all the time. That could be a bad pun, couldn't it? No, like, you're allowed to not take your identity in what you do, your identity as a son or daughter of the living God, right? So I'm going to look at what I'm becoming, not what I am, not what I'm doing, not what, I'm, what I am right now, but who he has for me. And then you see John the Baptist say in, in John 3.30, more of you, Lord, less of me. That's always a good prayer. That's always a good prayer. I want that old nature gone, and I want to yield to the new spirit you put inside of me called Holy Spirit, because just because he's in you doesn't mean you're yielding to him. It has to be a conscious decision, and often it's grinding against what your flesh wants you to do. So it's not an easy decision, is it? But that's why having prayer partners and, and other people that will intercede with you, so now, now it's really like, I don't know what he wants me to become yet. You know, I've only had 14 words that say the exact same thing, but I'm still not sure he wants me to write a book. <laughs> I don't know what he wants me to become. But the world is waiting for us to become what God wants us to be. In, in Romans chapter 8, it says in, in one translation, the whole world is on tippy toes waiting to see the manifestation of the sons of God. That's all of us. Yeah, but you don't know my background. Hey, look, as far as the east is from the west, stop looking in the rearview mirror. Look through the windshield. Stop regretting all the terrible things that happened. Where are you now? How can you be more like Jesus? We could all just hold each other accountable and say, help me. I give you permission. Speak into my life. If you see something that doesn't look like it lines up, I give you permission. Be kind. Speak the truth in love. But speak the truth to me. I'm okay with that. And then I had to say, what are you waiting for? Right? If the whole world's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God... Stop letting things slow you down from, from this growth pattern. And again, I'm going to use the example that I said, which is from Matthew 3.11. John the Baptist said, he's not going to just baptize you in water. He's going to immerse you into a relationship with the Holy Spirit and fire. And fire is really important, right? Because the fire is what sat on the mercy seat in the tabernacle. 
But how many know we're in a new dispensation right now? All right, that was a picture. That was a lesson for us, the Old Testament. And in Leviticus 16, 13, he says, the, the priest is to go into that part of the chamber, the Holy of Holies, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of incense will cover the mercy seat above the testimony so that he will not die. So what we were doing this morning is releasing incense to the Lord. As we were worshiping, this is a, 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 an image, not the only image of that, but a picture of what it looks like for us to burn down the things that, that, that are what, the wheat from the chaff. The chaff gets burned. Only the things that remain make it through the fire. So whatever in my life that needs to be burned off, Lord, I'm offering myself up. And when you sing, I open up my heart to you, he might tell you something you didn't want to hear. But you gave him permission when you sang that song. That's why he's called Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> Not because he's bad sneaky, but because he's got to get around your armor plating where you're afraid to let stuff in. And then Mary, this is a great picture. I don't know. It's not a great drawing, let's say, but it's amazing. I hadn't put this together until a friend of ours showed us this in Scripture. John chapter 20, Mary arrives, right? She thinks he's still in the tomb. She gets to the tomb broken and sobbing. She stooped to look inside, and through her tears, she saw two angels in dazzling white robes sitting where Jesus' body had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. Now, how is that different than that? The angels are there, but what's missing is the offering. That was Jesus. He's gone. So they say, you can't find the dead among the living. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? But look at the picture of the ark. And it means that we're in a new season. We're in a new covenant now where we become the resting place. That's what we were singing. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? It's right here. You are the temple. Even though we feel defiled by the world, we feel like we've done so many things wrong, why would he allow me in this role? It's, you can't figure out why. He just loves you more than you probably even love yourself. It's so hard to grasp that for so many people, but just take it by faith. I don't know why, but I'm going to take a step of faith that he really loves me, even though so many people have said horrible things. You know, it says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. When you see him as a loving father, everything shifts. It's amazing. And that's the picture the Lord gave me of what this would look like. That, that it has now moved from inside the Holy of Holies to your heart, and the mercy seat is your heart, and the fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit that's coming up on the inside of you, and you are now a breathing and beating mercy seat. So you've got this thump going on of the Lord, and you've got this breath inside of you, and as you release worship, you're fanning the flame that's on the inside. Whoa! But now I become the sacrifice because I'm allowing him to consume the chaff that needs to be burned off. But it takes so much courage to say, turn up the heat, Lord. Oh, man, really? God would say, really? You want the truth? You sure you can handle the truth? Jim, stand up. You weren't here when I was saying happy birthday. This is his 85th birthday today, or yesterday. Stand up. Turn around, turn around. Come on. You got Caleb beat by a year, brother. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I love it. Oh, this just so enriches our lives to understand it's worth it. It's worth it. And, you know, the Navy SEALs, they say no man left behind. No matter how bad the battle gets, we're not letting you stay out on that battlefield. Like the guy did in Hacksaw Ridge, he kept running out. He, the guy in Hacksaw Ridge even brought back two Japanese wounded. <laughs> and they're like, sorry, no, we're not, we're not taking care of them. They're the enemy. But he understood, right? Like your enemy, that could change the whole the person's life. Oh, I'm going to keep going. We're not just the offering and the sacrifice. We're also the kings and the priests. So the more we burn off the chaff that doesn't belong there, the more effectively we can serve the Lord. And the more the personality of Jesus can take, take over in my life. The thing is, it looks different for each one of us because we're all so different. 
So his expression through you is different than me or Trish, right? Or whoever you, whoever you look at. And you want to look at the person's fruit. And, and the word also says that we're all producing fruit every day. And there's only two kinds, good and bad. I wish it wasn't so binary. Can't we have 50 shades of grapefruit? That's what your heart wants to do. Yeah, but, come on, no, no. Yeah, it's the word, if it says it in the word. I quoted it already, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from the Lord. Everybody here qualify? All right, well, if he's already in there, then there's only one opportunity. I have got to yield to him or try to ignore him. I'll leave it there. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And I know there's a lot of people here that know that they would not be alive today if they hadn't gotten saved. All right? So how do we get up on our high horse like we got all this pride in ourselves when we know that we'd be dead? It's, it's a free gift to have life. You know this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, living and holy sacrifice to God, a sacred offering that brings him pleasure. That is your reasonable and essential worship. Do not allow this world to mold you in its own image. Instead, be transformed from the inside out. You've already got the fire. That was a song we sang last week. You provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. Fill me up, Lord. We're no longer to offer up a steady stream of blood sacrifices, but through Jesus, we will offer up to God a steady stream of praise sacrifices. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. You got me through it, Lord, or you're getting me through it. These are the lambs. These are the sacrifices that we bring, that we offer from our lips that celebrate his name. You can learn a lot about somebody. You get in their car and you turn on the radio. Or they give you their phone and you look at the last 10 things they listen to on their podcasts. Or you know how it is. I was in the financial business for so long. All I would say is, well, if, if you'll let us do an audit of your checkbook, I can tell an awful lot about you. Because your treasure goes where your heart is. <laughs> Hebrews 4, I'll leave that one alone right there. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 15 says, Our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way just as we are. Isn't that good news? Like no matter what we're going through, Jesus could say, yeah, I remember that one. I was a man well acquainted with grief. I know about sorrow, just like you are, yet without sin. He conquered sin. Now we draw near boldly to where grace is enthroned to receive the kiss of mercy from God. Thank you for forgiving me. No matter how many times I turn my back on you, you never turned your back on me. You were like the father of that prodigal son that had his arms open, had the robe ready, had the ring, had the sandals for my feet. You were waiting for me to come back. I want to discover the grace that we need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. I could really go off, but there's only a few more verses from Hebrews that I want you to think about because we are in a new dispensation, and the author of Hebrews says it's a better dispensation. Say it, better dispensation. As good as the old was, we're in a better one now. But it moved from the temple, which kind of allowed people to be lazy, if I could just be honest. I'm sorry, but, I mean, it's part of our own natural tendency to, to like to check out sometimes. So if I, if I was in right standing with God just because I showed up at church, that was easier. I mean, we used to have to go to confession. You probably know what I'm talking about. And I would get in the car with my mother and say, I just apologize for something I'm about to go back out and do again tonight in another couple hours. So how sorry could I really be? It wasn't from my heart. So anyway, we're in a new dispensation. In the Old Testament, the priests would go into the first part of the tabernacle and perform their services, but into the second part, the high priest went all alone once a year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins that they committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was indicating through that 
that this way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing, okay? That's what I mean. New dispensation. Sorry, guys. I stay over there too much. I really love you too, very much. I don't know what it is. Something pulls me in that direction. I don't know. I repent. <laughs> Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. Woo! Imagine how tiring it gets year after year. You keep having to bring sacrifices, and it's never done. You're never forgiven. You're just living like treading water, just barely trying to keep up with all the rules. That is exhausting. And when you're exhausted, you look for counterfeit affections. When the, when the relationship with God is not vibrant and beating and breathing and fire, you start getting tired of religious ritual. Can we just renounce religious ritual right now? Lord, if there's anything in my life that I'm doing out of religious ritual habit, please help me reveal it. Reveal it to me. And, you know, somebody might say, well, you're a pastor. Don't you need a lot of help from volunteers? Well, of course. But what kind of volunteer do you want? The one who wants to be here. The one who's on fire. Or at least the one who's not, has no fire. I mean, David even gave that word. He didn't know what I was going to preach on today. But he saw that fire getting turned up in each of us. Sounds like a word. The world needs fired up Christians, don't you think? I do. <laughs> he came as the better high priest. Greater, more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. Not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves. But with his own blood. He entered the most holy place. Now, look, this is really important to get this because he brought his blood up into the tabernacle of heaven. When he ascended to the Father, he brought the ultimate sacrifice, his life, his blood. Nothing can wash away my sin. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because those goats, they had a short shelf life, man. They were going to be up again in a week. The blood of Jesus is eternal. Without sin, he... Just the cross wouldn't have been enough. He had to resurrect so he could bring the blood and say death is now defeated. Get it? I'm not putting down the cross. I'm just saying without the resurrection, the cross means nothing. I'm just quoting Paul. That's what he said. Your faith is futile if there's no resurrection. Well, we're in the 50 days between the crucifixion, resurrection, and, and the entrance of the Holy Spirit. You know, 50 is jubilee. He showed up on day 50. And it's really wild because when Jesus stands up in Luke chapter 4 and he reads the scroll, he says, today the jubilee is fulfilled in your ears. Whoa! That means every day is a jubilee with the Lord. He's forgiven our debts. He's canceling all that stuff out to the degree we're willing to yield to him. Yeah. It's not a rabbit's foot. Remember Reverend Ike? Nah, nothing lucky about it. It's called crucifixion and resurrection. You don't put a Band-Aid on it, you kill it. Oh, stop preaching that. You can't have resurrection without crucifixion. Sorry, doesn't work. Having obtained eternal redemption, how much more? than the blood of goats and calves. How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Can we stand? And maybe, maybe just make this a personal prayer. You know, I, I'm not as actively involved in the ministry uh, of, of deliverance as many of the people on our team, but I have kind of oversee it and been teaching about it for years. And I know for a fact that one of the hardest things for people is to forgive themselves. All right? You didn't say amen, so maybe that's true. <laughs> it's a reverse amen, silence. So that might be one of the things. I have to cleanse my conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Dang, that's good, isn't it? Dead works. You're doing it, but there's no life in it. It's mechanical. So look, if you came to me and you said, hey, pastor, you said I'm supposed to pray, and he told me he wants me to step down from a certain ministry. I would be like, okay, no problem. If that's what you heard, and you know how to hear God, as long as I it bore witness with me, I mean, that would be an easy out too, wouldn't it? But 
Look, like, it, it can't be that God would never say that. You never step down from ministry. You're never doing too much. You should do more. God will love you more if you're in more ministries. That's a lie. Nothing you could do to make him love you more. That's why it's grace. Supernatural. It's grace. I'm not saying don't be involved. I would love you to be involved. But because you heard the voice of the Lord, not a guilty conscience, all right? So can you lift your hands for a minute? I just say, Lord, help me. Clean my conscience from dead works so that I can serve you, the living God who lives in me. I'm only a couple more left. For this reason, you don't have to repeat it. You can just look up here, okay? For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. All right? That's what we're in. We're in the better covenant of Hebrews. He's the mediator. He forever makes intercession for Jim Bennett on the back row, for Dorcas on the back row, for whoever you are up in the balcony, wherever you are online. He's making intercession for you right now. He forever lives to be the mediator of this new covenant. When you try to condemn yourself and say, he could never love me for what I did, he's saying, yes, he does. Trisha used to stand in the mirror and point her finger at, the, at, at herself in the mirror and say, he loves you. I mean, that really, that jolted me like, man, that's faith. You're overcoming that lie by the truth of the word, even if you have to point at, it, at yourself in the mirror and break that thing off of you. Because don't say about yourself what God doesn't say about you. You just keep repeating the promises of God. Somebody I heard recently said there's 7,000 promises in the Bible. Man, that'd be good to memorize, wouldn't it? <sighs> For, he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, right? Covenant, a will, a last will and testament. When Jesus died, you became an heir to the kingdom. Your name was written in the will. Wow. You got a rich father. For the redemption and transgressions under the first covenant. Man, this is good. That those who are called say, I have been called. I have been called that I might receive the promise of the internal inheritance. So I want to try to stretch a little and say the eternal inheritance is not just dying and going to heaven. All right? You with me? Don't throw tomatoes at me. It's better than just dying and going to heaven because that's a kind of a defeatist mindset. It means this world's going to be a mess, so we might as well just hang on and hope we don't, and we fail to make the cut when we die. That's a lie. That's denying us of the current operation of the kingdom of God. As it is in heaven, let it be here. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We've been given the keys of the kingdom, church. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. I'm just singing the songs that we sang today back to you, right? Like, we got to believe what we're saying. But just look, it doesn't have to, you don't have to go from being a, a, a private in the army to being a general. You just don't want to get put in jail and you don't want to be demoted. Every day, help me be more like you. That will be my last prayer. If you could just lift your hands one more time. Every day, Lord. I want to be more like you. I'm willing to let you burn off the chaff of my life so that I can live on fire in a greater measure for you. Let my life be that sacrifice. Fan the flame and let me do great exploits for you in your kingdom here on earth and for eternity in Jesus' name. 12, 12, that's a good time to end a service right there. <laughs> 12 is a redemptive number. I love you all. I bless you. I thank you for being willing to be here with us, be a part of this tribe, for being assembled here with us, even you folks up in the balcony. <laughs> Don't be shamed up in the balcony. You've got a good view up there. Love you all. See you again. There's no fellowship today. Enjoy your day.